episode 65 of The Actors Room. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for listening. Julia, Luis, Dreyfus, coming at you. Here we go. who wish us well and those who don't can go to hell <laughs> <laughs> all right who's dancing come on who's dancing you want me you want me to get it started i'll get yes. it started <laughs> Fancy Moses. Elaine Bennis. God, what a character she played on Seinfeld. Grounded. Stable. Opinionated. Hilarious. Did I just say she was stable? Boy, I'm wrong about that. (laughs) Not stable. Very off for rocker. Uh, Maybe stable in a way that suited her fine and Jerry Seinfeld and Jason Alexander and, of course, uh, Richards, Michael Richards, who played Kramer. Jerry Seinfeld was a part of one of the greatest television shows of all time, and he brought along with him Jason Alexander, who I actually met. Way back in the day, in New York City, long time ago, my family and I would go out to New York to see plays and musicals. We saw a musical one late night, and we would stick around afterwards just to see who was there and to get autographs from the castmates that were in the production we just saw. And we happened to be one of very few people hanging around the theater inside. And we're just hanging out. And this guy's walking by. It was Jason Alexander. I said, and my brother Dave, I said, Dave, there's Jason Alexander, man. The guy from uh, Seinfeld. He's like, no way, that is him. I walked up to him. I don't know what happened to me. I got this like surge of uh, confidence. Because I usually don't do that sort of thing. I'm pretty shy. I walked right up to him. I said, hey, I know you. And he shook my hand. He had a big smile on his face. He was very nice. Jason Alexander. Very cool. He brought along with him. These these actors. It clicked. What a show. Seinfeld. And Julia Louise Dreyfus. Is one actress that. Displays. A personality. That is so engaging. Am I right? Dreyfus has the it factor in terms of screen presence. And how comfortable she looks in front of the camera. Into the screen and then projected across our screen into our living rooms. Family rooms, whatever. She graced that screen on Seinfeld for, I believe, nine seasons. What a character. What an actress. I don't do many actresses. Well, I haven't anyway. In the past, I've did. Um, I've did. I've done Marilyn Monroe. That was about, I would say, about a year ago. 
maybe a little more recent than that. I did Meryl Streep over a year ago. And I think, uh, is that it? I thought I did someone else. Maybe not. That might have been it. Wow. (laughs) So there you go. Long time coming. I'm going to try to do more actresses from here on out. And Julia Louise Dreyfus is one of note, must be talked about. Here we go. She has received 11 Emmy Awards. Eight for acting and three for producing. With a total of 24 nominations throughout her career. 24. She has received a Golden Globe Award. Nine Screen Actor Guild Awards. Five American Comedy Awards. And two Critics' Choice Television Awards. She received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2010. And Time named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world on the annual Time 100 list. In 2018, she also received the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor, presented by the Kennedy Center as America's highest comedy honor. Woo! I think she's pretty good. She will describe herself as an actress. I've heard her talk about it in the past. She brushes off people telling her she's funny. This is something that I got from her doing my research. People tell her in interviews, You are so hilarious. I love you. You're the funniest or one of the funniest comedians, actresses I've ever seen. And she just cringes. For some reason it bothers her that people are telling her she's like the funniest person they've ever seen and blah, blah, blah. She doesn't buy it. Uh, She's very modest. I love that. She seems like a real down-to-earth person. Salt of the earth. Great human being. Welcome back to the Actors Room, everyone. Episode 65. My name is Jeff Tarowski, and it's been a week. Folks, Cleveland, Ohio was under a cold spell, so to speak. I think it was, uh, what, uh, Wednesday, Thursday. Negative 28 degrees, man, with the wind chill. It was breezy. It was chilly. I didn't really leave the house that much. I left to go to the store for a few minutes, and I regretted it. And then the wife and I had, like, a lunch date the next day. And it was cold. The first 5, 10 seconds you're outside, you're like, okay, it's cold. And then after that, it like it starts like sinking in. That, okay, this is abnormally cold. I need to get inside. So I wasn't out much. Didn't have to work. I work at a college. So it's a school, right? It closed both days on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. And what's funny is I had last week off, on vacation last week. And then this week, I had Monday off. I worked Tuesday, and then had the next two days off because of the cold. And then I had Friday off. I I did work today. I've worked like three days in the past two and a half weeks. I feel very spoiled, very rested, feeling good. Did my research. I'm Mrs. Dreyfus. Not Mrs. Dreyfus. If it was done correctly, it would be Mrs. Hall because that's her husband's name. I was going to say father's name. Her father's name is Dreyfus. Her husband's name is Hall. Brad Hall. A comedian as well. They met way back in the day in 1986, I believe, when she was in college. Northwestern University. She went to Northwestern, met her husband in 86. They've been together ever since. Now that is rare. In the entertainment field, in Hollywood, showbiz, actors, singers, getting together, getting married. I would say 95% of them don't work out. Think about it. About 95%. How many 
famous people have been together for a long time or are still together. Think about it. For just like three seconds. I'll give you three seconds. Exactly. You couldn't come up with one. And if it popped in your head, uh, Goldie Hawn and uh, Kurt Russell, I think they kind of broke up recently, but they were together for a long time. But they never married. Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn never married. They were together. Sort of a open relationship type deal. <laughs> they were a thing. Uh, never got married and were free to see other people. And they have kids together and stuff. They live together. They have kids together. But Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell are so in tune and open that uh, Goldie can go off and uh, do what she wants and Kurt the same. Uh, I read Goldie Hawn's book a long time ago and she explained in the book that she understands men that... Uh, Their purpose on earth is to uh, spread their seed, so to speak. She says she she understands that. And that a man, that's uh, they want to screw everything that walks, basically. And she accepts that. So I guess Kurt is uh, allowed to go and, uh, you know. That's rare. Goldie Hawn. Sure. Hey. 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 I mean, she feels uh, being monogamous is not a requirement. But getting back to what uh, I do this in my episodes, those of you who are new listeners, and there are some of you, uh, thank you for listening. I go on tangents, which means I have a topic. And this week, it's Julia Louise Dreyfus, right? That's the title of the show. And I have talked about her and will continue to talk about her. But at times, something else will veer me off to over there. And I go there. And sometimes I go there for too long. So I apologize. We're going to get back on track talking about Julia. And she has known her husband since 80. They were married in 87. That's a long time. They have two sons together. Uh, I believe they're in their late teens, early 20s. Uh, Two good-looking kids. And I have to tell you, folks, I had a big, huge crush on Dreyfus, especially when she was on Seinfeld. I thought she was adorable, cute, uh, beautiful, just uh, beautiful hair, beautiful skin. Uh, Big fan. And I thought her acting was inspirational. Um just dead on her comedic timing, her improv skills, her, her delivery, her personality comes through. She said that Elaine is a lot of her. Of course it is. Um, it comes through in her work. It's believable. Um, my acting teacher at the neighborhood playhouse, Mr. Gary Kingston, one of my favorite teachers of all time, actually, as far as teachers go, period. Always gushed over Julia Louise Dreyfus and Elaine. He felt that character in Seinfeld was the most grounded character he's ever seen. She was so good. He told us, go and study her. Study Elaine and that character. There's a lot to learn from her. And I did. I listened to my teachers as as much as I can, you know, if I'm paying attention. And in acting school, I did. I, in acting school, when I look back, there are a lot of things I wish I would have done differently. Uh, I was very young, very immature. And if I went to acting school, say, today, I think I would have done a lot better just because of the maturity factor. Um, I missed out on learning extra things in school that uh, I took for granted back then, but I was 21, 22. So, uh, most of my, um, colleagues were around the same age, uh, some older, uh, there were, uh, one guy, uh, Peter Picard. Hey Pete, he went to Harvard. He went to Harvard and then decided after Harvard, he wanted to try acting. He was great. He was the best, 
uh, classmate doing exercises, and he was very intellectual, and he uh, got things pretty quickly. Um, and uh, Pete was great, great. Uh, I, once again, listen, off topic, but I'm talking about acting, right? Right. Uh, so I'm going to get back on track talking about Julia, and we'll touch upon her childhood. She grew up in New York City, born in Manhattan, and I have her birthday right here. We're going to say her birthday, too. What do you say? She was born on January 13th, 1961, and like I said, Manhattan. Her mother, Judith, was American-born and a writer. She was also a special needs tutor. Her father was French-born, and his name, Gerard Louis Dreyfus. And I want to get back to Julia's real name. It's right here. Julia Scarlett Elizabeth Louise Dreyfus. So part of her name is her dad's name. And uh, a few middle names. Scarlett and Elizabeth. Scarlett was a name that was uh, preferred by her grandmother. And I guess Julia's mom didn't like the name. The grandmother persisted. (laughs) Wouldn't let it go. And I guess the grandmother got her way because her middle name Scarlett and Elizabeth. So maybe the grandmother and the mom sort of said, okay, I like this one, but I like this one. Uh, 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 uh. And they both got their way. But Scarlett is before Elizabeth. I don't know if that means anything. They could have went Julia Elizabeth Scarlett, but they did Julia Scarlett Elizabeth. So I think the grandmother didn't win the war, but she won that battle. Julia is a great-great-granddaughter of Leopold Louis Dreyfus, who in 1851 founded the Louis Dreyfus Group. It's a French commodities and shipping conglomerate, which members of her family controlled into the 21st century. That's kind of a big deal. Uh, Her paternal grandfather, Pierre, was president of the Louis Dreyfus Group. Pierre was from a Jewish family. And they had a a word before Jewish. I uh, didn't even attempt to. I'm going to try it. Alstation. Alstation Jewish family. And he remained in France during World War II, fighting as a cavalry officer and later in the French resistance. Her paternal grandfather was born in America to parents from Brazil and Mexico during the 1940s. She moved Julia's father to America from France. So she's got a lot of nationalities inside of her. Um, She, I don't know, I could see that. A little bit of Mexican and uh, German. Um, That's cool. I'm mostly German and Polish. So that's all right. But get this. In 1962, Julia, one years old, right? Parents, they break up. Divorce. Sucks. So she didn't ever get to see her parents together while growing up. I was lucky. uh, Although my parents eventually split. Um, They were a big part of our childhood. My brother and I. And although they're not together anymore, um, it was great. uh, Having two parents that uh, were around and supporting each other. Julia didn't have that. And she'll go on to say that that was tough. Um, Bouncing around, back and forth. Both her parents loved her very much, but it was hard for her. And she explains this later on in interviews that I listened to. Um, She comes across and is very, you know, she explains it. She said it sucked. I never knew my parents together. Uh, I think from what I gather, they got along okay, but they couldn't live with each other. And so Julia had to sort of share uh, her love with her parents separately, 
which is tough to do. It may have been something that Julia kind of kept inside and used in her work. A lot of artists do that. They'll uh, pick and choose what to use in their art. And Julia may have done this in her acting. Julia and her mother moved to Washington, D.C. when Julia was eight. And this is when her mother remarried. And she married a man named L. Thompson Bowles. And he was a dean of the George Washington University Medical School. So during her childhood, she moved around a lot. Her stepdad was all over the place. And here are some of the places that she grew up in a time in her life, that young, eight, nine years old. Uh, don't know how long it lasted, but these are the places that she was living. She lived in Vietnam, Colombia, and Tunisia. And she graduated from Holton Arms School in Bathsta, Maryland in 1979. She was a good student for my research. She kept her nose clean. She's a good girl, got good grades. She was uh, bubbly, great personality. Uh, everyone liked her. She had talent, promise, a lot going for her. So she decided to go to college. She attended Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where she was a member of the Delta Gamma Sorority. She studied theater. She majored in theater and performed in the Wamu Show. It's a student-run improv and sketch comedy review. This is where Julia shines. In comedy review type atmosphere. Improv stuff. That's what she's good at. She is quick. And it shows in her work. Especially in Seinfeld and later on. When we'll talk about her most recent work. Veep. Fucking great. My wife and I are watching it right now. We're about. I think we're about done with season two. And um. It's a little bit of a slow go. We'll get into that later. But touching upon the fact that in college, at Northwestern University, she dove in and absolutely crushed it on stage doing improv skits, sketches, reviews, something. It just, you know what? I'm going to tell you something right now. This is not an easy thing to do. There are not many people. Especially actors. And good ones. Good actors. They can pull off sketches like that. Improv stuff. Do you remember that Drew Carey show, um, What's My Line, I think? Don't. eh, It's been a while. Where Drew Carey and I think some of the castmates he had on the Drew Carey show. And uh, they would do a show. And they would just do improv. I remember watching that show. Loving most of it. But some of it's cringeworthy because you're not going to nail it every time. And I'm sure Julia didn't nail it, nail it. She didn't nail it. She didn't nail it every time. I mean, nobody's perfect, but I'll I'll tell you this. I'm sure she nailed it a lot, man. She did a great job in improv. Okay, she was so damn good. And I went on and on about the fact that she's really fucking good at improv. She caught the attention of some people. This troupe that she was in, pretty successful, right? College, things like that. Well, she happened to uh, just, uh, you know, get a taste of it even more by joining Second City. Second City is located in Chicago. She was able to uh, express her talents on the stage at Second City. Once again, not easy to get into, but she's there. Doing well, right? You're working, doing a fine job, you're funny, people will notice you. People did. One night, there was, oh, a few people, I believe, watching the show, enjoying it, and were just captivated with Dreyfus and a few of her castmates. They were from Saturday Night Live. They actually, it's like in the movies, folks. That's what Julia said. It was like scripted, 
movie stuff that you see where they come backstage after the performance and tell you how great you did and how, oh, they're going to offer you a job. That's exactly what happened. They came backstage, professed their love of the show, and asked if they would come on Saturday Night Live. They didn't even have to audition. Julia was offered a job on Saturday Night Live. So just like that, at the age of 21, she didn't even graduate from college yet. This was only her junior year. And she was having success already. She was that good. And she was now a regular on Saturday Night Live. Julia was on the show from 1982 to 1985. And was at that time the youngest female castmate ever. She appeared alongside several very successful future actors. Which were Eddie Murphy, Jim Belushi, Billy Crystal, and Martin Short. It was during her third and final year on the show. She met writer Larry David. And if you don't know who Larry David is, oh, he just happened to create Seinfeld. (laughs) She met him on her final year on the show. I Wait, maybe his final year. It might have been hers too. Because in 1982, when Julia got on Saturday Night Live, Lorne Michaels wasn't the main guy. I guess there was a small window between 1982 and I think 1986 where Lorne Michaels wasn't involved in the show. And that's when Julia was on the show. And during that time, they the show was different in a way. And things were done differently because Lorne wasn't there. Julia says that Although it was just an honor to be on SNL, and it was, she thought, like, hey, this is going to be great. Yeah, it's going to be like how I do my sketches in college. Uh, It was like everybody working together in harmony, working sketches out together. I guess that's not the way it was when she was on the show. Uh, Castmates like Joe Piscopo and Eddie Murphy... Um, I forget a few others that were on the show at that time. She said that it really wasn't like that. There really wasn't uh, people working together. It was more like everybody for themselves. And she felt really out of place. Plus, she said, like everybody else or everybody on set were just, there was drugs, drug use. uh, uh, People partook. Okay. Uh, They did their own thing, got wasted, and it really wasn't a family atmosphere. Uh, She said she learned a lot, um, quite simply just uh, learning how to work in front of the camera, in front of a live audience. This is uh, experience that uh, she took to heart, and when she left the show, uh, leaving Saturday Night Live, she was uh, looking for work. She said that being on SNL really didn't help her career that much. I find that hard to believe. I'm sure it did. I mean, she was on SNL for 82 to 85, three, four years. That's that's a long time. That's a national big show. There are millions of people seeing you every week. It's going to help your career. It's going to help your image. But she felt that... The show itself, SNL, wasn't a good experience. I don't think she can come right out and say that, oh, she looks back and smiles upon Saturday Night Live. She doesn't. The only thing she smiles upon is the friendship she received when she met Larry David. Larry David was a writer on Saturday Night Live for only one season. The last season for Dreyfus as well. She states that they became friends very quickly. Uh, I think that she said that uh, Larry David was a very nervous, anxious guy, always, you know, something going on. And she wasn't, she was more sort of quiet. But they bonded. 
because he was very unhappy, Larry was, about being on the show. And so was uh, Julia. So they had a lot in common. But, come on people, she made a very big connection at this time in her life. And she says that I watched the actor studio with James Lipton about a week ago to prepare for this show. And she says that you have no idea. And she's looking out. Okay. Um, looking out on the crowd that is listening to every word she says. These students, these actors, directors, these hopefuls are sitting in classrooms learning about the art form that she has mastered in a way or is successful. I mean, she's up there talking to James Lipton. He's asking her questions. She's answering them. And everybody, all the students are, you know, they're interested to hear what she has to say because she's successful. And she looks out on all of them and says, you have no idea how much luck plays into being a successful entertainer across the whole board. Luck plays an important role. It's where you are at the right time. And she met Larry David at the right time because a few years later, a few scripts were thrown on Julia's desk. And one of them was called The Seinfeld Chronicles. And she saw, written by Larry David. And the rest is history. And I kind of sang there and it sounded really lame. I apologize. That was really bad. (laughs) When I listen to this later, I'm going to keep that in there just because I hate erasing stuff. And uh, I am trying to be full of humility and things like that. I'm okay with people picking on me now. Well, to a certain extent. I could be picked on, you know, but then you got to let it go. I can't have it, you know, continue on and on. And I'm going to go off topic right now. I love stand-up comedians. Love them. I think they're so brave going up there, doing their thing, being funny, Okay, and I would go to a lot of stand-up comedian, you know, performances in New York City way back in the day. Always enjoyed them. Even today, I will just go on YouTube, put in George Carlin, and just all day listen to his stuff. But like, like I said, I would go see stand-up comedians all the time in New York, and I did. The one time I went it was a late night. My wife and I, and I think my brother, went to see a show. Like, we did a lot. This guy signaled me out, man. He wouldn't let go. He wouldn't wouldn't let go. He wouldn't let it go. The whole fucking show, man. I had on this um, Umbro uh, soccer shirt. For some reason, I love soccer gear. I loved, like, the shirts, the shorts, the shoes... Socks, whatever. Adidas, I love Adidas. I think I had an Umbro shirt on and it was it was really red, like bright red. <laughs> uh and so I'm sure it stuck out. So I, I'm sure I shined, you know. So he saw me pretty good. It was I guess the shirt was a little sh- it was a little short, a little tight, a little small on me. And he went off on me about my shirt, about the fact that it was it was short and tight and Uh, It wasn't fun for me Okay (laughs) I give him credit But you know I try to show humility As much as I can But if you don't let it go I get a little frustrated I remember walking out of that show I was pissed And my wife is like Don't let it get to you You know I mean he was just up there doing his thing And I understand that I do But it was at my expense I was the one being picked on That's no fun for me (laughs) A little sensitive. I still am pretty sensitive. <laughs> it's like, dude, lay off me, man. Move on to somebody else. You know, after five minutes, it's like, uh-huh, there's other people in the crowd. Let's spread it. Spread it around, man. Anyways, before we get to Seinfeld and talk a little bit about that, 
I want to mention a few movies she did before this awesome show. She did Soul Man. I don't know if any of you out there know about Soul Man in 1986. Soul Man with C. Thomas Howell. C. Thomas Howell wants to get into Harvard. His dad won't give him the money. Like, C. Thomas Howell gets accepted to Harvard. But his dad's being a dick and says, I'm not going to pay your way. You have to pay your own way. And C. Thomas Howell's like, I can't pay for this. He finds, like, a way in. Okay? The way in is to take a bunch of tanning pills to make himself look black, to be on scholarship. And he goes to Harvard as a black kid when he's really white. The show is bad. The, the movie's bad. But I, it was part of my childhood. Watched it a lot. Soul Man. You got uh, Darth Vader in there. The, the Darth Vader voice guy. My goodness, I'm bad with names sometimes. I'm not moving on until I remember Darth Vader's name. <clears throat> it might be a while. We might be here. Okay. We'll have to move on. Hopefully it'll come to me later. It will. I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look it up right fucking now. Okay. James Earl Jones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's in the movie. And I feel really bad. I forgot his name. I'm bad with names. I had to look it up. James Earl Jones plays a Harvard professor. He's in the movie. Another actor I love. Our Gross. Love that guy. He actually keeps in touch with me. And uh, just a fantastic guy. He does theater work still. And he's been in a lot of TV stuff. Um, he's in it too. He's really funny. Um, she was also in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I've highlighted that movie a few times in this podcast. Just alone itself a year ago for Christmas. And then my brother Dave and I uh, went ahead and did an episode highlighting uh, several Christmas movies that we love. So we touched on that one again. And she plays uh, Chevy Chase's neighbor, Stuck Up Lady. And she ends up having a dog attacker and everything. Uh, and uh, Chevy Chase, of course, was on Saturday Night Live when it first was born. He was only on for one season. But both of them went and starred in Saturday Night Live. So a connection right there. And, of course, the Christmas Vacation movie is just a gem. And she was a part of that film. She also had a small role in a Woody Allen film called Hannah and Her Sisters. She thinks that she was a little nervous doing this because she messed up a lot. She had a very small scene. Very short. I watched it. uh, Maybe 30 seconds. Almost like an extra with lines, she says. She was so nervous to do it. Woody Allen is her idol. When she found out she got the role, she was nervous immediately. And when she had the chance to act with him and found out she'd be acting a Right alongside him. It's a short scene. She's right next to him. And I guess one of his lines was, Stop. And Woody directed the film as well. And as she's acting with Woody, and he says, Stop. She stopped and said, Yes? What? What do you want me to do? And Woody said, No, 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 no. I'm not being a director right now. I'm being an actor. That was my line. She felt so bad. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, take two. Well, he says stop again. It's in the dialogue. And once again, Julia stops and says what? And he said, no way, you did it again. And at this point, she's flustered. And in an interview said she thinks she did it a few more times. She was that nervous. But Woody didn't forget about her and had her in another movie down the road. And Julia took it was very excited and was flattered that Woody remembered her, number one, and number two, saw her success in Seinfeld and wanted her to be in one of his films, Deconstructing Harry. She read the script, was very excited, and her husband Brad asked her, 
well, are you going to do it? And she says, of course I'm going to fucking do it. It's Woody Allen. I mean, as long as, like, I'm not going to have to blow him or anything. She said that. (laughs) And wouldn't she know that her part in the movie, she's giving Woody Allen a blowjob. True story, that's what she says. Hey, these things, you know, they connect somehow. Blowjobs, I guess. Julia Louise Dreyfus became famous for her role of Elaine Bennis in NBC's Seinfeld. She played the role for nine seasons, appearing in all of them, but three. I guess she wasn't on the very first show. They like to call it the pilot. It was called Seinfeld Chronicles, and she wasn't in it. Why, you ask? Hmm. Well, because she wasn't a character yet. Her character wasn't born until a little later. And this happened because the executives felt they needed a woman character. There are too many guys, they said. You need to get an actress in here and get a good one. They found Julia and they didn't let her get away. Other actresses that were up for the uh, Elaine role were Patricia, Patricia, Patricia Heaton, Rosie O'Donnell, and Megan Mullally. On the uh, DVD of Seinfeld that you can buy, I have one of them. They have special features on there. And Jerry Seinfeld said that when they found Julia, they were very happy. And she performed so well on the show that they know they made the right choice. No doubt about it. She said that it was the greatest experience she's ever had working. And they became like a family. Although her success in Veep is noteworthy, I don't think it can match what she received just working on this show with Jerry and Jason and Michael. It was truly magical and could have gone more than nine seasons in the casting process of Julia to play Elaine, Jerry Seinfeld and all had each actress breaking apart M&Ms and she did it the best. Jerry says her ability to eat Peanut M&M's without breaking the peanut amply describes the actress. Quote, she cracks you up without breaking your nuts. End of quote. Her performances in Seinfeld earned her two Golden Globe Award nominations, winning once in 1994, nine Screen Actor Guild Award nominations, winning one in 1995, and two in both 97 and 98. And seven American Comedy Awards, winning five times in 93, 94, 95, 97, and 98. In 1996, she received the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series, an award she was nominated for on seven different occasions. From 92 to 98. And she finally got one. I went through her list. It was like going through Meryl Streep's list. This this actress is like the Meryl Streep of TV. She is. I don't think there's... I think they said... She is the most nominated actress in TV history. That's important, people. She's amazing. She is. Is she underrated, maybe? Because uh, I like to throw that word around a lot. I do. I just do. When I see a brilliant actress, actor, and feel they don't get enough recognition, they're underrated. <laughs> like People should be walking around every day going, uh, yeah, Marlon Brando's the best. And Julie Louise Dreyfus is, is the best TV. Right? It should just be in your head, right? You should just know it. Common knowledge. And if you don't, Okay, that means she's underrated. I know, I make no sense. 
All right, looking at my notes and seeing how awesome of an actress she was on that show. It will be in the future. In 1998, Seinfeld decided to end the series after nine seasons. Very sad. It was a big deal. Uh, They could have gone longer. Julia explains that the very last show was very emotional. They all got together like they always did before the show. They would all huddle together and just be with one another. Julia remembers looking up and seeing Jerry Seinfeld crying the first time she ever seen him cry. And when she know it, it made her cry as well. She just, she couldn't believe it. And um, it was a very emotional moment for her and everyone else. What a show. Unforgettable. A gem. Going down in history. It made all of them a lot of money. And uh, just a great experience for everyone involved and for us, the audience, to see. After Seinfeld wrapped, uh, she did a few films. Uh, She did Father's Day, opposite Robin Williams and Billy Crystal. And of course, I mentioned she did the Woody Allen Oscar-nominated movie, Deconstructing Harry. She also would do uh, a voiceover. For A Bug's Life, a movie that we own. Kids love it. She lent her voice as Snake's girlfriend, Gloria, in The Simpsons. That was episode A Hunka Hunka Burn in Love. And in 2001, she made several special guest appearances on Seinfeld's co creator, Larry David's show, Curb Your Enthusiasm. She played herself. Fictionally trying to break the quote-unquote curse by planning to star in a show in which she would play an actress affected by the Seinfeld-like curse. This curse thing. It's this thing. They said that, oh, because Jerry Seinfeld and Jason Alexander, Michael Richards weren't like huge successes after Seinfeld. They call it the Seinfeld curse. Such Bullshit. I mean, think about it. All these actors and Julia doing this Seinfeld show. Historic thing. Historic. You can't get much better success-wise in your career. And what are you supposed to do? Do better than that? Yeah, good luck. Ain't gonna happen. Seinfeld cursed my ass. And Larry David agrees with me. He's like, that's such bullshit. I mean, why even talk about that stuff? They did such great work on that show. Leave them alone. And if they continue onward with their careers and do something else, great. If not, great. Whatever. Fuck them. It was just, I think, insulting to someone like a Jerry Seinfeld or or someone like Julia. And although Julia will go on to uh, success, uh, she did struggle a little. She did... A show called Watching Ellie, and that premiered in 2002 on NBC, right? Yeah, NBC. Didn't do well. I guess her husband was involved, Brad Hall. I think he wrote it, and it just didn't do very well. It happens. I don't care how great of an actress you are. Sometimes the premise is not good, the timing not right, and it fails. Do you know how many sitcoms fall through the cracks every year? I mean, probably hundreds. There are very few that make it. There are very few that go past the first season. So, I mean, it it happens. And Julia kept trying. And she will try again. This time, a little better with her next show. It was called The New Adventures of Old Christine. I sat and watched it. Didn't remember that much about this show when it came out in 2005. I just don't remember it. At all. (laughs) I was like, what the f... What is this? (laughs) Sat down, watched it the other day. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. There's something off about that show. It wasn't for me. It just... I tried to get into it. 
I didn't really care too much for the characters. There was one actor that I liked um, that was on the show. Um, but overall, maybe I need to watch a little bit more of it. But my first impression was I'd rather watch something else. I love you, Julia, but that show, not for me. But you know what was for me? Veep. Veep. 2011. And I think they're going to be going into their final season this upcoming year. I like it. I love it. It took a few episodes for me to kind of get going and really get into it. But I love it. And uh, this is a hit. Of course. And I recommend it very much. She plays the Vice President of the United States and puts the comedic spin on it. I like the feel. The flow is fantastic. And she shines. I think she's been nominated for either an Emmy or a Golden Globe. Every year. Every year. She's tremendous. Please watch Veep. Recommend that one. And of course, almost everything else she's done is amazing. Julia Louise Dreyfus, episode number 65 of The Actors Room. Thank you so very much. For listening to me talk about Julia. uh, An actress I consider to be a genius. She's one of them. Without a doubt. I mean, I didn't even think twice about that when I said it. She's a genius. And you should see her that way too. Yeah, absolutely. Just because I believe it. (laughs) Because I know everything, right? I don't know. I think I know a little bit about acting. I love acting. I do. I love judging performances. Uh, Not only with certain actors, but almost any actor. I just love picking out things. uh, And then I'll ask my wife about it. And of course, I talk to my brother about it endlessly. About performances and actors and things like that. I think we may want to collaborate Soon, my brother and I, I have an idea about a show. And I might as well reveal it now. I want to do an episode or two. However long it takes. I want to do an episode centered around underrated actors or overrated actors. I think that would be fun. Might get a little interaction with my audience about that. Which would be great. um, Because they're going to be people that disagree with us. I'm both overrated and underrated because uh, people can be very passionate about an actor and actress. That should be fun. I think there's some actors out there that are very overrated. And I think there are some, or a lot, if you listen to my shows, uh, nearly all actors are underrated or the ones that I think are good. (laughs) I don't know why I do that. Like in my mind, Marlon Brando is underrated. Because I don't think he gets the recognition he deserves. Like, I think everyone should think Marlon Brando is the best ever. But he's not. But he is in my world. So he's underrated. I know, it makes no sense. But to me, it makes sense. Please support the show. Go onto the actorsroom.lipson.com. Go on the website. You got to do it on a desktop. Go on there. Dedicate to the show. I have a donate button. You go on there. You click it. Donate 50 cents. Donate $5,000. Donate $20,000. So I don't have to work at my Xerox job anymore. That'd be great if I had like, I thought about this. Wouldn't this just be fucking fantastic? And like a one in one trillion shot. Like some bored billionaire out there somewhere. Like, completely bored, right? Loves podcasts. Finds my show. Kind of likes it. Hears about the fact I have a donate button, right? Has some money just laying around. And decides every month to just donate, oh, I don't know, $20,000 a month to the show. Wouldn't that be just fantastic? A one in trillion shot. Like, some guy just being like, yeah, yeah, I'll just uh, payroll this kid. This guy, kid, this guy, I still think I'm a kid, 
whatever. <laughs> I'm 42. I'm not a kid. Um, but wouldn't that be great? That little donate button possesses so much possibility. <laughs> like anybody could just click on it and be like, <laughs> I'm going to give this guy <laughs> five cents. <laughs> and they could, right? I'll take it. I don't care. Donate to the show. That's my point. That'd be awesome. The support really helps me in wanting to continue doing what I'm doing and producing great shows. You can also go on to iTunes. This actually helps the show even more. Going on to iTunes, even though I would appreciate some money, going on to iTunes, on your phone, on the computer, you go on there and you review it, which means that you type in doing a great job or you type in doing a bad job. But the main thing is actually getting on there and doing it. And then clicking on those stars that are right up on top. There's five of them. Go ahead and click all the way to the right for five stars. They'd be great. It helps the show be seen by other people looking up actors, movies, and shows. Thank you once again. Go out there tonight, see a movie, or stay in and watch a film or a show or a documentary. Folks, I am absolutely addicted to documentaries right now. On my vacation, I think I watched about 10 of them. The one I watched yesterday, I'm crying. What a... It was like family related. And uh, there was a dog that looked exactly like my dog that was in this documentary. And the dog like ends up dying during the documentary. I'm, I'm crying. I'm, I was so emotional. I look over at my dog. He's like sitting right next to me. I look over at him I'm like, oh, <laughs> don't die, man. Very emotional. I get like that. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. My voice is starting to go a little bit. Going to wrap this up. Thanks again. See that movie. Enjoy it. Enjoy great art. Because sometimes it really lifts you up when you're feeling down. Hope you're not feeling down. But if you are, pop in something funny. Raise your spirits. Have a great day. Have a great night. God bless you. Have a good one.